Well, thank you for the electronic insights. All right. And I'll cue up my little rant about the state of National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure funding, uh, but our third Ryan of the evening has a little tale to tell about his recent purchase of a bolt. Yeah. Take it away, Ryan. Okay. <clears throat> Go grab the mic. Okay. So what's your last name? What, what's his last I, uh, name? I was in such a rush to get here. I left my hearing aids at home, so I'm damn near deaf. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, um, I may have uh, told you before about my attempt to buy a Bolt from uh, Burien Chevrolet uh, months ago. But anyway, that didn't work out. And so I was just biding my time until this year when the IRA passed and Chevy Bolt is now eligible for the full uh, federal tax credit. Um, so I called around to all various uh, Chevrolet dealers asking them what their markup was. And all of them said anywhere between $2,500 and $5,500. And I'm like, ah, oh, geez. So I thought I'd called around to all of them, but I missed Lee Johnson Chevrolet in Kirkland. Well, I'm looking on the Inside EVs forum, and I notice in the Chevy Bolt uh, forum, somebody named Atomic 80, that's their handle, had gone to Lee Johnson Chevrolet and got a reasonable price on a Bolt. So I decided to go do that. Drive up there, walked in, spoke to a pleasant salesman named Thomas. The Bolt is 26,500. The uh, destination charge is 995. The dealer markup is 2,000, and I also got the uh, level two charger um, unit, which is $295, I believe. All up, it's gonna be $29,790. And they ran a check, I've signed some papers, they ran a credit check, and I came out perfect on the credit check. Um, and then they told me that the lead time we're looking at is six to eight months out, which is why I pulled the trigger now, because eight months out is November, and I want to get that car this year. <laughs> and then the salesman tells me six to eight months out is, that may not be true because I've seen them come in as soon as two months. I said, oh, great, even better. Well, as I've signed everything and I'm getting up to leave, the general manager, Marcus Andrews at Lee Johnson comes over, sits down and says, oh, just to keep you in the loop on the up and up, I have to tell you, when the bolt comes in, the price may increase 500 to 1,000. And I said, no, it's not. He says, no, yes, it is. And I said, why? He goes, well, in case OnStar increases their cost to us, we have to pass it on to you. And I had printed out the entire specification sheet for this thing and highlighted everything that was standard. And OnStar is standard. I said, no, that's standard. You just swallow that cost. He goes, no, no. If it increases, we'll pass the cost on to you. And I said, and he says, and also if GM ups their MSRP, you're gonna have to pay the extra. And I said, we have a signed contract. I'm not paying any more, not one penny more than what's on that signed contract. And he says, it's not a contract, it's an agreement. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, if I come back to pick up that car and you ask for one penny over what's written on that, 
I'm walking. And he says, fine, and we'll return your deposit. I said, fine. So I paid my deposit, and I get out of there, and it isn't until I get home that I realize I signed everything, but they signed nothing. The only thing I have is their receipt for the $2,500 I put down. And, and the, the thing is, is no, their signatures on nothing. And they didn't even give me the original to the receipt. They gave me a photocopy. So I'm just waiting. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> but as those of us who testified in favor of the bill to allow Rivian direct sales in Washington found out, car dealers are your friends. They're so, bastions of the community. Yeah, they're they're of our valuable they're services. They're here to, to and provide take care of wages. you. Yeah. Yes, dealerships, every one of them. <laughs> Which will be a nice entree to the rant, because um, you may recall that I am deep in it now. I'm no longer just a woolly-headed advocate yelling from the sidelines. I have to actually try to make this thing work. In between the copper thieves and the new edicts out of Washington, D.C., it's becoming increasingly difficult. I mentioned the rash of copper theft that's been going on, and... Who has read the new electric vehicle infrastructure final rules, all 172 pages of them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Summarize them. <laughs> Summarize them. Here's the rule as published, and my summary is one size fits all. Thou shalt have a minimum DC fast charging site capable of charging two vehicles simultaneously at up to 350 kilowatts. And you, yes, oh, or each vehicle. Uh, they, they can go down to, to uh, 100, I believe, when multiple vehicles are connected, but they have to be able to dispense that minimum, even if you're in the middle of Mon Montana in the middle of summer, that's the minimum. And no Chatamo for you. Uh, if you, if you fulfill all of their minimum requirements, you may then use any leftover money to install a Chatamo plug, but not after 2023. It is verboten after this first funding year. Wow. Yes. And no NACS, otherwise known as Tesla Supercharging, formerly proprietary standard, now officially open, but nobody else is using it yet. You know, so you want to get a little out of that. No? Aptera maybe. Aptera maybe. They got around that with an adjective. But the bottom line for Aptera has been maybe for 10 years. Yeah. And uh, not even a requirement to provide level two charging at these new super new fast charging sites. We all know level two is important as a backup. If there's a failure on the station or the vehicle, it's the reliable standby, and it's the only thing that serves a lot of the plug-in hybrids and the first gen EVs out there and the soon-to-be orphan Chatamo cars, but no AC charging is required on these. And this being the federal law, everything else is expected to follow in its suit. So uh, that, that is kind of disappointing. And then <coughs> any employees of government entities in the electric vehicle charging space around here or related <coughs> nonprofits? No? Good. Because this is what we're dealing with. I spent uh, another useless couple of hours this afternoon in a fourth webinar, fourth being the competing nonprofit in Portland that came up out of nowhere and has a talent for sucking millions in federal contracts. Uh, it was on the list earlier this, well, last week that Washington. Department of Commerce has issued a solicitation. They want to spend, how much was it? $1.3 million, 300,000 of which is available be, uh, to be spent by June 30th of this year to help foster connections between historically underserved communities and teach them how to apply for future EV charging grants and to build a website. No copper in the ground. No drivers actually trained, no new drivers behind the wheel. But it, this is what is being done in the name of equity. And in the upper right hand corner, we have the program specialists that have been hired by the state and the nonprofits, all fresh faced, optimistic, and zero driving experience. <laughs> and so they put together things like the new Puget Sound Regional Electric Vehicle Collaborative. 
Can you see what's wrong with that picture? It's kind of dark, but that Getty image was a European spec Model 3 using a CCS2 plug. And so this guidebook for local governments, the splash photo on the cover is an unobtainium port on an unobtainium car, neither of which are available in North America. And, and this is the advice that our local governments are going to be giving. So I sent a polite message to their webmaster today. <clears throat> but you can learn about this and more at EV Roadmap, which is the leading conference in the US, put on by our friends at Ford. And there they have a very diverse audience speaking to you about how to accomplish electrification. And some of them have driven electric cars before. So uh, oh, wow. yeah, uh, <laughs> but I attended many years as a volunteer and they probably still have uh, generous volunteer stipends available. Basically, if you serve as a room monitor, run a clicker at the door, or run the microphone for the speakers back and forth during the Q&A, you get free registration and maybe even a t-shirt. So I did that for years before I had an employer willing to pay for the conference. So it's a good experience to crash their party if you want. And then I was gonna do a project update, but we're about out of time. Uh, my pusher trailer, as previously mentioned, is progressing at amazingly rapid pace. I should have it ready in time for Greenwood, but it is the front end of a Carmen Ghia grafted to the very back end. The useless part that carried the people in the middle is gone. It will only carry cargo, and it's a pusher. It'll start off as a gasoline engine pusher, making a through-the-road series hybrid, as I've done twice before with other versions of, less beautiful versions of the pusher. Uh, starting with the one that J.B. Straubel built while he was in college, <laughs> former CTO of Tesla. And it could be an electric pusher because it's got a full Volkswagen suspension and the ability to carry lots of weight and lots of cargo inside, so stay tuned. What Any color? other? What? What color? <sighs> well, fair, fair yellow. Yellow. <laughs> it, 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 much, much debate goes into color. And as I have a white on blue car and a white on yellow car and a pure Windsor white Ford Ranger <coughs> EV, we just go in with white. <laughs> it's the cleanest color. It, it shows dust the least. And as a trailer, it will be covered with dust whenever it's in use. So that's going to be cool and fun. Stephen, a few words, if you like. Yes, okay, please. Well, the main <laughs> thing I want to tell you I'm really excited about is that uh, after the COVID hiatus, Bellevue College, we're going to have the car show there again. 